a $15 billion dream, India's first bullet train, a project meant to turn an eight-hour journey into just two. But now, that dream lies stranded in the dust. The tracks stop halfway, the stations stand silent. And the debt? It's exploding, from 14 billion to nearly 18. What was supposed to be a symbol of progress has become a battlefield of blame. India, Japan, China, even Germany now tangled in one massive controversy. How did a high-speed promise turn into a high-stakes crisis? Because this isn't just about a train, it's about power, pride, and the price of ambition. So what really went wrong? And who should carry the blame? Let's find out. Imagine standing on a crowded platform in Mumbai. The heat, the noise, the smell of diesel thick in the air. Trains packed so tightly that people hang from the doors, fighting for space just to breathe. For millions, this is everyday life. Hours lost in traffic jams and endless delays. The Mumbai Ahmedabad high speed rail was supposed to change all that. A sleek silver line connecting two of India's most powerful cities one the financial heart, the other an industrial engine. Mumbai, with its skyscrapers and Bollywood dreams, contributes over 9% of India's total GDP. Ahmedabad, the textile capital, fuels the country's manufacturing base. Together, they represent the pulse of India's economy. A high-speed link between them wasn't just about saving time. It was about transforming opportunity. Cutting travel from eight hours to two could have unlocked billions in trade, tourism, and jobs. It was meant to connect ideas, not just cities. But today, that promise feels distant. The trains never arrived, the tunnels were never finished, and the hope that once filled these stations has been replaced by questions. How did this project, once hailed as India's ticket to the future, fall so far behind? To understand that, we need to go back to where it all began. It all began in 2017, a moment that felt historic. Indian Prime Minister Narendra Modi stood beside Japan's Prime Minister Shinzo Abe, smiling beneath the blazing Gujarat sun. Cameras flashed, flags waved. The two leaders pressed a button together, launching what they called a new era of speed and progress. Japan promised to provide 81% of the project's funding, a staggering $12 billion, through a long-term, low-interest loan. In return, India would use Japanese technology, the famous Shinkansen bullet train system, proven for its safety and precision. It was more than a deal. It was a friendship, a symbol of India and Japan standing together against China's growing influence in Asia. At the time, Beijing was pushing its Belt and Road Initiative across the region. This train, many said, was India's own answer a rival vision of development built on transparency and trust, not debt and dominance. The ground was broken, maps were drawn, the future felt unstoppable. But soon, the glow of celebration began to fade. Paper promises turned into real-world challenges, ones that no one had truly prepared for. Because building a bullet train in India would prove far harder than anyone imagined. The engineering dream was breathtaking, a 508-kilometer corridor linking Mumbai and Ahmedabad, cutting travel time from eight hours to just two. Trains would fly across the Western Plains at 350 kilometers per hour, using Japan's Shinkansen E5 technology, the same used in Tokyo-Osaka routes renowned for near-perfect punctuality. Nearly 90% of the track was to be elevated, gliding over highways and rivers minimizing land disputes. Another 21 kilometers would run through tunnels, and inside that, a seven kilometer undersea stretch, India's first of its kind. The technical scope was enormous. New bridges, viaducts, depots, signaling systems, and power lines, all built to Japanese safety standards. Engineers said it wasn't just a train, it was a mobile classroom for Indian industry, meant to transfer high-speed rail expertise, train local engineers, and elevate India's rail technology by decades in one leap. But to make that vision possible, the project needed one thing above all, 
Specialized Tunnel Boring Machines, or TBMs. And those machines would become the very tools that later halted everything. These weren't ordinary digging machines. They were engineering marvels known as shield-type tunnel boring machines, capable of carving precise circular tunnels through mixed soil, rock, and even underwater terrain. India needed the horseshoe-type shield TBMs, a German innovation known for stability and precision in tight geological conditions. Compared to manual excavation or basic drilling, these mechanical giants could dig five to eight times faster, keeping the tunnel walls sealed and safe as they advanced. Each one was worth tens of millions of dollars, a fusion of hydraulics, electronics, and robotics. Imagine a rotating metal beast the size of a jetliner fuselage slicing through the earth with surgical accuracy. India's planners knew that domestic industry wasn't ready to build such machines yet. So, they turned to Germany to source world-class shield TBMs that could tackle the ambitious undersea tunnel section between Thane and Varar. It was a logical choice at first, until one detail changed everything where those machines were actually made. And that's where the geopolitical twist began. Here's where the story takes a sharp turn. India had signed a procurement deal with a German firm, a reputable supplier known for precision engineering. The contract? Roughly $330 million for three massive horseshoe-type shield TBMs, essential for the undersea tunnel. But as production began, Indian officials discovered something unexpected. Though the design and technology were German, the manufacturing was outsourced to Guangzhou, China. That's right. The very heart of India's flagship high-speed rail project now relied on equipment being built inside the borders of its biggest strategic rival. At first, this detail didn't cause alarm. After all, many German companies manufacture components in China to cut costs. But as geopolitical tensions simmered, every shipping route, customs declaration, and origin label began to carry political weight. Still, the machines were completed, crated, and prepared for shipment. Three gleaming steel-clad giants ready to burrow India's first bullet train tunnel. Until suddenly, they weren't going anywhere because just before they were due to be shipped, China refused to release them. In October 2024, the project hit its breaking point. Those three German-designed, China-built TBMs, each worth over $100 million, were seized inside a bonded warehouse in Guangzhou. No clearance, no shipment, no progress. Customs cited regulatory and export review reasons, but Indian officials saw something else a deliberate choke point. Without those TBMs, the entire undersea tunnel section was paralyzed. Work on the Mumbai underground station ground to a halt. Excavation data tells the story. Only 142,000 cubic meters of earth had been cleared out of the required 187,000 cubic meters. That's like digging halfway through a mountain, then having your tools locked away. Satellite footage and on-site reports showed idle cranes, fenced pits filling with rainwater, and workers sent home indefinitely. Billions of dollars in schedules, contracts, and interest payments all suddenly frozen because three critical machines couldn't leave a Chinese port. And the financial pain that followed was devastating. The numbers began to spiral. The original financing, a $14.6 billion soft loan from Japan, was structured for a smooth 2024 completion. But every month of delay meant more interest, more idle labor costs, and higher material expenses. By late 2024, estimates showed the project's total debt ballooning past $18 billion. What was once a national showpiece had turned into a fiscal sinkhole. India's broader economy wasn't in ideal shape either. With fiscal deficits widening and foreign exchange reserves dipping under pressure from global oil prices and import costs, Tokyo's next loan tranches grew harder to justify. Contractors struggled to get paid on time. Subcontractors paused operations. Even Japanese firms began quietly questioning whether India could meet its repayment schedules. The ripple effect extended beyond the tunnel. 
Delays in one section pushed back station completion, track laying, and even land acquisition payments. And when the numbers got this big, so did the politics. Because someone had to take the blame. That's when the blame game erupted, loud, public, and global. Indian media headlines accuse China of weaponizing trade logistics by refusing to release the TBMs. Officials framed it as another example of Beijing's shadow tactics, linking it to the 2020 border standoff that had already chilled relations. Government spokespeople hinted that China's actions were deliberate sabotage of a project designed to symbolize India's rise. The logic was simple. If India successfully built Asia's next high-speed corridor, it would become a regional tech and infrastructure competitor. But the controversy didn't stop there. Germany, too, found itself awkwardly dragged in. Since the TBMs were its design, Indian agencies demanded that Berlin take responsibility and intervene. Yet Germany quietly noted that production had taken place in China, outside its legal jurisdiction. Behind the scenes, diplomatic cables flew between New Delhi, Berlin, and Tokyo, each trying to diffuse blame without admitting fault. And as the shouting got louder, something crucial got lost. The quieter story of India's own internal missteps. Because not every delay came from abroad. Behind the public outrage, another truth simmered quietly. Some of the wounds were self-inflicted. Long before the TBMs were seized, India had begun restricting visas for Chinese engineers and technicians. The very experts needed to assemble, calibrate, and maintain those complex tunneling machines. The move was rooted in national security concerns, but it left project sites short-staffed and struggling to interpret the intricate German-Chinese schematics. At the same time, payment delays piled up. Some contractors reportedly waited months for reimbursements as budget committees argued over cost overruns. And deep inside India's rail bureaucracy, a different kind of thinking took hold. Why depend forever on foreign tech? Why not learn from this project, copy the process, and eventually build local TBMs? But the plan backfired. Reassembling a TBM isn't like putting together an engine. It's a precision alignment of hydraulics, electronics, and pressure systems, often requiring the original manufacturer's calibration software. Without the right specialists on site, progress slowed to a crawl. And now, as deadlines vanished and interest rates rose, India faced a harder question. Could the project even recover without those specific machines? Technically, replacing the C's TBM sounds simple. Just order new ones. But in reality, it's anything but. Each horseshoe shield machine was custom designed for the geology of western India, calibrated for mixed basalt, clay, and high-pressure groundwater near the coast. You can't just buy a spare from another site. Experts warned that reordering from scratch could take 18 to 24 months, plus another six for shipping, assembly, and testing. By then, entire sections of the corridor would need resurveying, since soil conditions shift over time. Could Indian engineers build their own? Not yet. Domestic manufacturers produce smaller TBMs for metro projects, but not at this 13-meter diameter scale or precision. Even with Japanese guidance, building replacements locally would require new tooling facilities, foreign parts, and extensive training, easily pushing timelines toward 2030. So for now, the official line is schedule revision. But within engineering circles, the phrase everyone uses is more honest, reset because what began as a sleek 2024 completion goal has quietly morphed into a six-year detour, one measured not just in time and money, but in lost confidence. And that loss carries lessons far beyond one tunnel. Step back for a moment, because this story isn't just about one railway. It's about how geopolitics now runs through every bolt and circuit of modern infrastructure. The Mumbai Ahmedabad high speed line shows how national pride projects are no longer built in isolation. Every made in Germany machine may have Chinese components. Every Japanese finance project may depend on Indian regulatory timelines, and every delay can ripple through three or four economies at once. 
Around the world, similar dramas are unfolding. In Indonesia, the Jakarta-Bandung high-speed rail, also backed by China, faced two years of delay over imported systems. In Africa, power plants stalled when European turbines needed spare parts stuck in ports due to sanctions. The pattern is clear. The more globalized a project, the more fragile it becomes. For countries like India, it's a test of technological sovereignty how to industrialize without becoming hostage to another nation's supply chain. And for Japan, China, and Germany, it's a wake-up call about the cost of interdependence that in today's world, even a single machine can become a diplomatic weapon. Which brings us to the final question. Who truly bears responsibility when progress halts? In the end, the Mumbai Ahmedabad high speed rail project stands as a cautionary monument to our interconnected age. Every actor had a role. India, pushing to modernize faster than its systems could adapt. Japan, financing and advising but bound by its own political caution. Germany, outsourcing production to China in the name of efficiency. And China, holding the machines that could move everything forward but choosing not to. Blame circles endlessly, but the real culprit might be the very structure of global infrastructure itself, where progress depends on fragile chains of trust that can snap at any moment. The $15 billion dream now carries $18 billion in debt, a half-finished tunnel, and millions of commuters still waiting for a faster tomorrow. So here's the question. If China released the machines today, would that truly fix the project? Or would it just cover up the deeper issue that in the race for national prestige, cooperation has become a casualty? What do you think? Should China release the TBMs? Or is this project already too tangled in politics to save? Tell us your thoughts below. And if you found this story eye-opening, subscribe for more deep dives into the world where technology, power, and politics collide. A train meant to unite two cities has instead revealed how divided the world has become. This isn't just a story about tunnels and trains. It's about trust, about how every bolt and sensor in the modern world carries the fingerprint of geopolitics. Because when nations stop cooperating, even the strongest machines can't dig us out. Subscribe for more stories that reveal the hidden side of global power.